All right, welcome everybody to the Zoom event. We are about to get started in just a moment. We're gonna give everybody a chance to connect to audio. Uh, feel free to turn on your, your video just here at the very beginning of the session to say hello to everybody. Um, and in just a moment, we'll be getting started. Hey, Diane, how's it going, Diane? It's going, yay. Nice to see you. Good to see you, Ryan. Thank you for doing all the tech stuff and being here to help us out when we have tech issues. And as you know, because some of us have plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, with our forces combined, uh, we got this. We got uh, it. Yeah, so I'm going to pass this over to you, Diane, to, to welcome everybody. And I'll, I'll come back in in just a moment to okay. say some more technical Zoom things once everybody's in. We, we have okay. a good number of people already, Hi. 39. Hey, Ryan, do you know, has the movie finished? Because I know some people are, are watching it now. Uh, the movie has finished, yes. Okay, great. So We're I could, here. So it's time to say good evening. Welcome. I'm Diane Peterson. I'm a member of the A to Z Impacts of Plastics team. We are the people who put on not only this event, but the A to Z Impacts of Plastics Summit, which you are now in. The summit starts now. It runs until Sunday, September 20th. So thank you for coming to the conversation with Steve Wilson, the creator of the film, The Story of Plastic. And I wanna take just a moment to entice you to keep, keep tuning in to this event, to this summit. So just to let you know what's happening. So you know what's happening tonight, I'll tell you a little bit more later. But Friday, please join us again from seven to 10. We're going to have Healing Hearts Art Night. At seven o'clock, Will Falk, the author of the Ohio River Speaks will join us. And he'll open us up and lead us into artist David Solnit, who is going to help you and me do an art build at your home. So this is gonna be a lot of fun. This is a chance for us to do art do some visual art, do some performing art, while we actually get to listen to other artists do their thing. So at eight o'clock to nine o'clock, we will have music by performers Mike Stout, Susan Powers, and Mamuse. Starting at nine o'clock, it's your chance to perform. So don't be shy if you wanna sing, if you wanna do a poem, whatever you wanna share, that would be great. So like I said, Friday night is the night for the arts. You're going to make something, and that's going to come in later that we'll be using that on Sunday. What's happening Saturday from 10 to 2? It's our main event, so please join us. We will have a solutions and actions panel and discussion, and this is quite the panel. We have everything from students to activists to photojournalists to even a general. So this should be really exciting. Oh, there we go. Our, our tech guy is helping us out here, I see. So um, we have Diane Wilson, Rajani, Julie, General Russell Honore, William Barber III, and Luke Early. So you can read all about them. Um, there's a lot going on at our Impacts to Planets, the Agency Impact of Plastics uh, Summit. Please check out impactsofplastics.com for all the details. I'd love to tell you everything about all the people that are coming but then we'll be here all night listening to oh. me, which I don't think is what you want oh. to do. So Sunday, we will have a solidarity, social media action and toast. This is your chance to share your art build and to see what others have made. So this should be a lot of fun. So what's happening tonight? Well, after a quick introduction and a short visit with Ryan, our tech guy, who's going to make sure that everyone knows what you're doing, as far as tech and how to get into all these events. Then we will be hearing from Steve Wilson, the creator of Story of Plastic. He's gonna tell us how this all happened. And then I'm really excited that we will be hearing a being part of, eventually, a three-week conversation between award, filming, award filmmakers, Steve Wilson, Melissa Troutman, and Mark Dixon. Now, they're gonna have a really great conversation, but soon after that, it's gonna be your chance. So please, if, if a question comes or comment comes in your mind, put it in the chat, because right after their conversation, it's your turn. 
So don't wait, put your, put your comments there. I, I can't promise we can get to all your questions and comments, but we'll give it a good shot. So anyway, um, Ryan, could you please tell us about the tech aspect of the summit? Absolutely. So, um, hey everybody, my name is Ryan and I'm on the technical team here for the summit. I'm also uh, on the operations team for Health the Harm Network. And Health the Harm Network is a project that offers services like event production, um, email uh, production, all sorts of different um, consulting and campaign support services for everybody who's fighting oil and gas. So it's so much fun to be part of a project like that, that is a network that brings people together, connects you with other members of the movement and stuff like that. So the summit and the technical aspect of it here to welcome you to the space, uh, really to share my screen and show you you're here already. So you have some experience with this. You can see that we've created a so social network for all of us that are attending. So along with this list of events that you've just seen and the ability to join in and see which events are currently active and live, you can also see all the members that are here uh, participating in this event. There's so far hundreds of people who've signed in and you can see on the activity feed all the details that you need to see. So for this particular event um, in Zoom, we are gonna mute everybody during uh, the first part of the conversation um, so uh, that's something you can expect. Also, we are recording and streaming this live as well. And so you'll be able to follow up with the recording later if you need to. Um, you can say hi in the chat. It'd be great to see who all is here and where you're tuning in from. It'd be fantastic. Uh, so please say hi in the chat and tell all of us where you're tuning in from, maybe what brought you to this particular topic or event. It'd be so cool to connect with all of you. And um, let's see, before we, we jump in, I want to show you that you can, in the top right, you can switch from speaker view to gallery view. And if you do that, then you can wave hello to everybody else who's here, which is really fun. You can see a gallery and you can see everybody's here. So good to see everyone here. Um, and in the chat, we've got some, uh, some comments. Uh, Patricia in Forest Hills, Pennsylvania. Great to have you here, Patricia. Uh, Ronnie in Pennsylvania, Newcastle. Uh, and ooh, Jim is in Glasgow, Scotland. Welcome, Jim. We're seeing definitely as this event started to spread, more and more people uh, signing up from other parts of the world. So welcome. So glad that you're here. Um, and I'm going to play a welcome message from uh, BJ, uh, BJ McManama, who's part of the A to Z Impacts of Plastics uh, planning team. So I'm going to share my screen again, just so I can uh, bring you this welcome message. Um, and real quick, I need to share my computer sound for you so I can play this message. And here we go. This evening, we are virtually gathering in Appalachia, the Ohio River Valley, the original home of the Seneca, Shawnee, Lenny Lenape, Cherokee, Mingo, and so many others who have been lost in time. Before the strangers came, the people here thrived, blessed by the bounty within the mountain mists, along the rivers and streams, valleys and ridgetops. Then the strangers came. Some were power hungry and greedy who brought pain, destruction, and death. Others came to live a new life, far from the chaos of monarchies and vicious rulers. They found an unbelievable bounty of wild game, plants, trees to build their homes. Some followed in the footsteps of the original peoples who taught them how to live here. The food, the medicines, the ways to survive and prosper. Today we must remember and live by those ways. Turn to the elders and faith keepers. Listen to their warnings and their guidance. We all have ancestors, many indigenous to their original lands, all with wisdom and knowledge grounded in natural law and true to our original instructions to take only what you need, you use all that you take, walk gently on these lands and leave a better place for those who follow. Thank you. All right. 
So thanks, BJ. And I know that she wished that she could be here live with you, uh, but we'll be at other events throughout the weekend. So looking forward to connecting more then. All right. So uh, again, I'll be in the chat if anybody has any technical questions. Happy to help about this particular event or the summit as a whole. And I'm going to turn this back over to our host tonight, Diane Peterson. Thanks, Ryan. So hopefully that will help. Um, this is the problem with doing things live is I was fearful I'd forget something, and I did. Um, and it gives me a chance to reiterate how much we hope to see you again, not only Friday night, but Saturday. Saturday, uh, the panel Solutions and Actions is not just a panel, it's not just a discussion, it's not just questions, answers. Um, starting at 10 o'clock when we start the panel, we will get that. But during our lunch break, let's, it's time to get personal. We will have people that will be talking with us about how the plastics industry has impacted their communities and them personally. Then after lunch, then it's your turn for you to take action. So we will be having small group discussions. Don't be frightened, it's okay. And then we'll be having larger group discussions and we're gonna bring this all into action. So it's not just how oh, that's terrible, oh, thanks for the information, but it's, it's action. So please join us on Saturday. Okay, enough said about that. It's time to get started. I am so excited. Putting this together, I got a chance to talk with Mark and with Melissa and Stiv. And as I've said to my friends, talking to these award-winning, award-making filmmakers <laughs> was like talking to three people in a candy store. They sounded more excited about being here than, than I am. So I was like, great. They were like, I can't wait. I can't wait to meet that person. I can't wait to talk about what we're doing. So I'm really looking for a lively conversation. And I am so glad that each and every one of you is here. This event is being recorded. So if you get really excited and you say, gosh, I really wish my friend would have seen this, please share it. So anyway, it is with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce Mark. Um, I have something to read because I don't want to forget anything. Mark is an award-winning filmmaker, photographer, activist, and public speaker exploring the frontiers of social change in a finite planet. After graduating from Stanford University with a degree in industrial engineering, he worked for startup companies in Silicon Valley before turning to documentary filmmaking. His productions include Yurt, Your Environmental Road Trip, through all 50 United States exploring it's environmental sustainability. It is a fun watch. Get it, watch it, it's fun. Um, and also he's done The Power of One Voice, a 50 year perspective on the life of Rachel Carson's. Important person, you need to learn about her. And, and also uh, one of his things he has here on his resume is that he went to cover the United Nations Climate Change Conference in December of 2015. Mark is currently working on a new documentary entitled Inversion, the unfinished, unfinished version, unfinished business of Pittsburgh's air. In his related advocacy and citizen science efforts, causing Pittsburgh's group against smog and pollution, which is called GASP, to name him champion for healthy air in 2017. He is currently working to develop a citizen science air monitoring network to surround the shell effing cracker. So all of this you can read when you go to Impacts of Plastics as well. Okay, take it away, Mark, and you hoo here we go. Great, great. Thanks, Diane. Uh, thanks, Ryan. I'm so glad to be here and so glad to have this uh, hopefully nourishing and fun and exciting conversation about all these issues that I care a lot about, deeply about, um, but obviously all of you do too. Um, and so please, um, as you're thinking of questions, feel free to drop them into the chat window. I'll be keeping an eye out on those um, and then... Um, yeah, and we'll get right, we'll get right to it. So uh, first I'd like to introduce Melissa Troutman, um, who you can see in the window. I, I wish it was all static for everybody, but she's right below me in my window. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a little bit about her. She's a director, editor, producer, and writer. And Melissa has produced three award-winning documentary films on fracking, uh, the first Triple Divide in 2013, and Triple Divide Redacted, brackets, in 2017, and Invisible Hand in 2019. 
She began investigating shale gas extraction in 2010 as a newspaper reporter in her hometown of Coopersport, Pennsylvania, before co-founding the investigative news nonprofit Public Herald, where she served as executive director from 2011 to 2018. Melissa's works at Public Herald have widespread coverage in environmental journalism, editorials, and major news media, including NPR Marketplace, Rolling Stone, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and Forbes. Her work has also been referenced in the books Amity on Prosperity, One Family and the Fracturing of America by Eliza Griswold, and Legal Rights for Rivers, Com Competition, Collaboration, and Water Governance by Aaron O'Donnell, and Sustainability and the Rights of Nature, An Introduction by Cameron LaFollette and Chris Mazur. She's won a handful a pile full, we'll say, of awards um, for her films, Humanitarian Award for Accolade for Global Film Competition, another one that jumps out, People's Choice Award for the Real to Real Film Festival. Um, I could go on and on. Her resume speaks for itself. And um, I'm so glad to have you here. Melissa, thank you for joining us and for being a part of this uh, conversation. I'm going to also now introduce, oh, I'm sorry, yes? Thank you. That's a, that's a very generous introduction. Thank you. Happy to uh, be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. So glad to have you here. Um, a fellow filmmaker who has a passion for um, holding authorities accountable. Um, I'm always happy to be in conversation with someone like that. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, okay. And now I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Steve Wilson, who, um, yeah, who is the sort of featured guest for the evening. And I'm going to read his bio. And I, I don't see Steve popping up in my window. Steve, are you, uh, can you make yourself visible? To, oh, there you are. I see it. Okay, great. Good, Steve. So you can just sort, sort through your windows on Zoom and you'll see him there uh, with trees, beautiful trees in the background. So, um, Steve, an award-winning activist, filmmaker, and educator working at the nexus of marine conservation, plastic pollution, and human rights, after completing 35,000 nautical miles sailing the world to study marine plastic pollution, Steve co-authored the first ever global estimate of plastics in the ocean in the peer-reviewed journal PLOS, PLOS 1. After publishing several other scientific papers on the abundance of microplastics in the ocean and freshwater systems, Steve went on to pass state level policy as well as the first plastics focused national policy, the Plastic Free Waters Act signed into law by President Obama in 2015. A frequent speaker on the issue of plastic pollution, his work has been met with critical acclaim, winning a United Nations Ocean Hero Award. He's a founder of the Break Free from Plastic, that's a hashtag, movement now comprising over 1800 NGOs across the globe, working in solidarity to end plastic pollution at all intervention points across the plastic supply chain. Wilson writes, on plastic issues for various publications and has been profiled in dozens of media outlets, including the New York Times, and has recently produced his first, first feature length documentary, which many of you have just seen, The Story of Plastic, which has earned several awards on the film festival circuit and is working with federal lawmakers to use the film to support first, the first comprehensive plastics legislation in federal Congress, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Wilson serves as an advisor to Senator Udall and Representative Lowenthal to develop the policy, to develop the policy with the ultimate goal of passing this historic act. Steve is the co-founder of the Peak of the Peak Plastic Foundation, a new organization focused on storytelling and campaign strategy for underserved frontline and fence line groups. He resides in San Francisco with his partner, his twin baby girls, and Mutt Lucy. Learn more about the Peak Plastic Foundation at www.peakplasticfoundation.org. Steve, it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome to the to the show, and um, and go ahead and and take the mic and tell us a little bit about um, what brought you here today, and um, kind of give us your origin story for this film and uh, basics of why you're here. Sure. Um, I grew up in the Midwest in Minneapolis, and was always sort of a water baby. And, you know, it was you uh, in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania region, uh, you know, you experienced winters. So I was, I was the last kid out of the lake in the fall and the first kid in, in the spring. And, you know, kind of grew up as like, 
somebody as I was swimming, I always loved water. I always felt calmed by water. And so it became just sort of this through line of my life. And, you know, I've always been a writer. Um, and I moved to the West Coast, uh, to Portland, Oregon, about 17 years ago. And I started surfing. And it was then that I sort of discovered plastic on the beach. And I, you know, I was, I wouldn't call myself at that point an environmentalist other than I was a nature lover, but I wasn't a, a quote unquote activist at the time. Um, but it's just really curious. And I studied uh, aesthetic philosophy in college. That is the, the sort of theory of beauty. And what really got me from the plastics issue at first was this aesthetic incongruency to the natural order. Like plastic is in the environment is sort of the visual evidence of climate change. It's the, you know, the shapes, the colors, the, the whole um, material itself just looks incongruent in nature. And it was that sort of dissonance that really put me down a rabbit hole. And I just started writing. I was a journalist at the time. Uh, and I started writing about plastic pollution. And at that time, people weren't really talking about it a whole lot. So um, I set out, um, I helped start a, a nonprofit called Five Gyres Institute. And our goal was to actually study plastics in the ocean to see if we could figure out what would be, you know, the, the first ever global density study of plastics, hoping that this would sort of spur um, action. And it did, it got a lot of attention and a lot of interest. We also did a similar study in the Great Lakes, which surprisingly got more attention. And I think, you know, that's because people in general tend to protect what they love. And uh, the, the Great Lakes system is, you know, it's, it's an iconic cultural piece of geography to, you know, anybody in the lower 48 in, in the middle of the country and Canada as well. So. Um, that actually led to passing the Microbeads Free Water Act that Mark mentioned in the oh so lofty and long introduction, um, uh, but I appreciate it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I never say any of that stuff about myself. Um, however, uh, you know, as I started investigating this issue more and more, working on sort of product campaigns, uh, I started like really looking at where this stuff comes from and where it goes. And I felt like the story that was being told in the media and sort of the popular consciousness was always the end of life story is what happens to plastic in the environment? What are the threats to biodiversity? And very few people were talking about what happens the second it comes out of the ground in the form of ethane. Um, and, you know, sort of midway in that journey I started going to, oh, and also looking at export countries, like where does our recycling go after you throw it in the bin? And sort of chasing that down to like China, to India, to Indonesia, um, increasingly now Central America, El Salvador, um, and then now Africa. I mean, basically industry is looking for anywhere in the world they can dump it because countries are wising up. And so I felt like these two parts of the system were where the human health issues were, where the climate issues were and uh, where the human rights issues were. And I took a trip to the Philippines um, originally just to go, uh, I was helping start a nonprofit in Hong Kong um, to deal with a mass that happened there by a Chinese company called Sinopec. And at the time I just threw out on Facebook, I said, I need to take a break from this. I wanna go, read books um, and be away from internet and uh, sit on a beach and swim on coral reef, which is my favorite thing on earth to do. And uh, a friend of mine said, you should go to the Philippines um, rather than Thailand because the beaches are better. And it's, and it's like, by the way, there's some amazing waste activists there. And I had never ended up going to the beach. I have since, but I never went to the beach on that trip in the Philippines. I just met this amazing network of activists um, um, in Manila, Philippines. And they took me to this place called Smoky Mountain. And Smoky Mountain is a landfill that is, is now closed to dumping. Um, however, there's a lot of organic material um, that's decomposing and the pressure 
uh, of the landfill of the weight uh, compresses, creates heat, and it makes it uh, flame. So it's actually venting uh, methane uh, that's burning from it. So this is why it's called Smoky Mountain. And in that landfill was probably 40 or 50 families that lived in it, that farmed in it. Um, they were growing food in landfill soil, as it were. Um, and then they would mine it for things that they could sell. Um, mostly metals, nails, whatever. And so this was a sort of subsistence level, uh, you know, existence, a dollar, dollar 20 cents a day, um, which allowed, you know, um, families to buy rice and water, pretty much un unpolluted water. And it was sort of like, it all came full circle. Like I, I, I realized there's this, this concept of throwing things away and, uh, you know, I was like, I'm standing in a way. I'm standing where a way is. I'm standing at the very end of the line. And at that moment, I was like, we need to tell a system story of, of plastic. And so at first, they started really looking for the story of plastic at the end of life, like, and the human rights violations uh, that are occurring from rich countries to poorer countries. Um, and, and then blaming these countries for the pollution in the ocean when it's literally us sending our crap there and opening markets aggressively. Um, because plastic, uh, from a consumption standpoint, has flatlined in the United States and North America and Europe. Um, and so they're, they're hedging growth on emerging markets in Asia and Africa. And also because, you know, technologies for energy are increasingly going um, more renewable and they're becoming price competitive, but the entire industry was pivoting to plastics as the way to uh, ensure increasing capital for the shareholders in the future. And that led us to the upstream piece of it. And of course, um, I understood, you know, the fracking issue, um, not to the depth or degree that um, I do now, uh, and there was this bombshell report by um, Center for International Environmental Law um, called Fueling Plastics and talked about 325 new um, refineries for plastics, ethane crackers coming online in the next seven to 10 years, which would triple the amount of plastic. And I was like, wow, you know, we're spending inordinate amounts of time trying to ban plastic bags in state legislatures, which is part of the issue. But there's two things that that, that, that doesn't address. One is the, uh, the inherent environmental justice issues that plastics pose on the front end and the, the, the health impacts that are tantamount to genocide um, for people of color living around um, these places, the historical, uh, the historical um, predication of that business model on keeping certain members of our citizenry in the United States down. Um, and overwhelmingly, those are people of color from Nixon's Southern strategy all the way forward. And, you know, at that point, we were like, we really need to tell the, the front end of the story. And I hooked up with Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Services in Houston. Um, and a woman named Yvette Oreno and Oriano and uh, became like a family member to me. Um, and she accepted me as a white guy, which uh, is tough when you walk into in some of these uh, spaces. Um, and, you know, our, the style of our film was essentially, we didn't want to make the same mistake that a lot of filmmakers, I think, make of it's sort of like, me bearing witness to a global crisis and how that makes me feel, you know, cause like really like forget me, you know, honestly, it was who are the people who are on the front lines fighting this and um, who are the affected communities at the fence line that are bearing the brunt of, of health issues? Because at that time, you know, the popular dialogue was about what happens if you eat fish that's eaten plastic when the real question was what happens from consuming more plastic that is that is predicated on the suffering of black and brown people 
um, in the United States. And so we wanted to get into that. And our, our next film is going to explore that more specifically and drill down on that. Um, looking at sort of the nexus of plastic pollution and racial justice. Uh, but ultimately, that's where Story of Plastic came from. And, you know, it was challenging because there's so many amazing folks in this movement fighting at all different points of the system. And to balance that in 89 minutes or less to create empathy with a character, get a little bit of a personal storyline, but also, you know, portray them as they are, which are total badass activists who are speaking truth to power against all odds was a significant challenge. And so um, we felt that, uh, you know, we, we had like 489 hours of footage, uh, which was a nightmare to go through. Um, but wonderful at the same time. I mean, we could, we could have made a documentary in each one of the places we visited because the stories were so rich and the networks of, of advocates were so rich. And, and so, you know, we left part of that on the table to just tell the whole system. And part of the strategy of Story of Plastic as I see it and the way I created it was, you know, if we're constantly talking about whales and dolphins as the, you know, the animals that are suffering from plastic, one, they don't vote. Um, and two, they can't respond to sort of industry framing. And if we are constantly pushing our problem to other countries, it's out of sight, out of mind. And you don't actually see the real human suffering on the other side. So to craft policy, we were like, we need, you know, we need more stakeholders um, in leadership positions throughout the plastics movement. And we also realized that a lot of climate campaigners who have been doing amazing work, but you know, to be fair, have been sort of stonewalled by industry for a really long time or just, you know, outspent um, or, you know, dealing with pushing back on propaganda um, through the lens of climate change. Well, you know, I don't know if you can see right now, I'm in, um, I'm up by Yosemite uh, in California and the AQI index right now is 369. Um, so it's, it's not a good place for me to, um, uh, to be it's sitting and breathing, but you know we're now starting to actually have some visual evidence of climate change, and the fires raging in the West certainly are that. But what I like about working on plastic is people understand it. If you go back to that moment on the beach that I talked about, about the aesthetic in incongruity, people understand plastic because everybody touches it. We touch plastic more than we touch our loved ones on a day-to-day -day basis, and so. This was a frame that we felt if we started storytelling with traditional quote unquote environmental justice, racial justice, or climate campaigners speaking about these plants that are being built to make plastic, we could get to another set of the population. And by the way, we could bring in a whole other set of stakeholders that need to be in the dialogue and leadership positions if we're going to win because white coastal elites are not going to win on plastic uh you know issues so this was a chance to build an intersection um and that was what our ultimate goal with story of plastic was was to create you know a massive like amplifier you know the biggest marshall stack you've ever seen um for for the great work that you know, these folks have been doing for decades. It just haven't had the same resources as white led groups um, and haven't had um, the same uh, access to, um, to, to, to microphones in sort of decision maker circles. And that was a chance for us to sort of bring up some folks. Um, and at the end of that, when we finished the film, we were like fairly addicted to this. So the people who made the film uh, formed a new nonprofit called Peak Plastic Foundation, recognizing that, you know, in the, the nonprofit space, 10% um, of the nonprofits get 90% of the resources, and most frontline and fence line groups are under-resourced, and they're not putting their money into communications or creating films because 
they can't because when they wake up in the morning, they're saving people's lives. And, um, and so they're dealing with existential threats all the time. So we're like, if we can do some curating of those stories to help, you know, these folks um, get their message out in a, in a bigger way, um, then that you know was going to be the most satisfying thing I could think of for my career moving forward, um, and sort of you know I am a musician, um, I, I you know I become a filmmaker, but I came a filmmaker by necessity, um, not I didn't I didn't study it, but, you know I've always been a writer, I was a playwright, um, so I understood how this sort of stuff worked, and and as a journalist, I you know I interviewed everybody in the film, which typically is what the director of a film would do, but um, uh, you know, I, I couldn't find a director who knew the issue as I did because I was sort of the only person, um, I was a very small handful of people who have sailed around the world looking at plastics, have been to the developing world where plastic is dumped, and also, um, you know, are on the front lines of fracking. And so you have like a lot of filmmakers um, at different parts of that system, but not all of them. And so um, I worked with Dea Schlossberg, who is well-known in fractivist circus circles. Um, she's an amazing human being and an amazing director. And I knew, you know, neither of us were super concerned about titles um, or credit. We just wanted to collaborate and get this thing done. Um, and that's where Story of Plastic came from. And, you know, it's, it's a real joy to see it get out into the world in a pretty substantial way. Uh, and, you know, have free and open access to communities like this one who want to show it. And so I'm uh, very honored to be here. I'm very honored to be um, in the company of Melissa and Mark. Um, these are very important voices and allies um, in the storytelling of, of this issue. And, um, you know, to be in that, that circle, uh, it, it's great. And, you know, it, it, it's fun to be in a part of my career where I'm just a bass player now. I'm not the lead singer. I, I'm, I'm just making the thing, I'm laying down the foundation and making the things that, um, that are, are, are allowing other people to step to the mic um, in, a, in a profound way. And that's, you know, I, until, uh, until I can't take it anymore, I think that's uh, what I'll keep doing. So the next, uh, the next thing we're working on um, is we're gonna go really deep into frontline and fence line stories framed through the lens of plastic and racial justice um, in this country. Um, starting with sort of the, you know, the Dr. Bullards and the Dr. Wrights who are the sort of the founders of, in, of environmental justice. Um, and then the sort of younger uh, generation uh, of environmental justice activists and we plan to you know work in the Ohio River Valley in Appalachia um, uh, along the Gulf Coast you know where this massive chemical buildup that needs to be stopped is is there as well as um, look at you know the experience of people living um, at the fence line around incinerators at the end of life um, and then uh, also one tie will zoom out um, to Kenya where um, you know, there's some pretty interesting uh, environmental justice um, collaborations between the United States and um, Kenyans on that being an emerging market for plastics. Um, so right now we're sort of in the research and development phase, the funding phase, all of that. Um, that's what will be coming next. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure if it'll be a whole doc or it'll be a series of vignettes, I don't know yet but um, I know it's a story that's screaming to be told. And I think it's been told really well uh, through climate. Um, but those meta connections to plastic is something I'm interested in bringing into the world. So uh, that's a lot of words. I hope uh, nobody fell asleep. Um, uh, thanks again for watching my movie and it's, it's really great to be here. And thanks for uh, Diane for organizing. Steve, thank you for that. That was great. And I think, um, don't worry about having lots of words. That's, uh, we need to use our words to communicate uh, on digital media uh, in a time of pandemic. Um, it's really helpful and it all brings us up to the same page on where you're coming from. And, and we can then, now we can think about, ask more relevant questions and move the conversation even further. So you've just brought us all up there. So thank you very much. Um, one thing that, that your comment reminded me of, um, uh, when you talked about going to uh, Smoky Mountain. Um, there is a, a 
a journalist that many of us may know, Amy Goodman with Democracy Now. And she says a thing, um, go to where the silence is. And that's sort of been a philosophical touchstone for me that I heard first from her. I, I don't know exactly when or where she wrote it or said it, but, um, but it always seems that she's going to where the silence is. And when people don't have access to microphones and cameras and all the gear and infrastructure that you're, you know, the foundation that you're laying, that going to where the silence is can really give voice to people who haven't had those voices before. Um, but also going to where the silence is, I think, has another metaphorical application that I wanted to introduce as sort of my first question to you and then also have uh, Melissa reflect on this as well, because I think as filmmakers, we run into these moments of silence. And, and when, when you sit there and let the interviewee sit in silence, they want to fill the space. And I've used that as a tactic to encourage people to go, go there and to, to fill the space. Tell me the thing that you weren't sure about telling me because maybe you're a little anxious about not telling me, but you're more anxious about not filling the space. Um, and also that happens when you turn off the camera. And so I'm really curious to both Steve and Melissa, can you share a moment in your own documentary experience where there was silence or you turned off the camera and the conversation shifted to the thing that they didn't expect or didn't plan to tell you or that they actively planned not to tell you until the camera was off. Because I found that some of the most amazing moments I've had in my filmmaking career have come from that and wondered if there were any off camera moments that you'd, you'd care to tell, keeping sure to anonymize the people who shared those stories with you so that you, know, you don't um, give away their secrets. Yeah, um, the two moments I'll say that sort of one, one sort of fits your question super relevantly. The second is, um, um, fits it more relevantly. But when I was in Smoky Mountain, uh, you know, these are people who make, you know, anywhere from a dollar to a dollar 25 a day. I had a $10,000 camera in my hand. Um, and I was feeling like photographing, and this was in the research phase of the film. And I felt like photographing it was exploitative. And at the same time, I was like, this can't be invisible. And these are real people. And um, it, was, it was hot, it was midday. And you know, in equatorial cultures, a lot of people rest during that time of day when it's too hot, too hot to do anything. And there was a man laying in the shade with a, probably about a four or five month old baby on his chest. Um, and I took a photograph of him and I had the immediate real, uh, realization of like, this is how messed up our world is. Like I'm here with privilege and the ability, you know, to earn the money to buy this camera, which he would never be able to do in his entire life. And I took the photo and then um, I, I put the camera down at that point because I was like, uh, you know, I, I, I was too uncomfortable. And he just looked at me and he looked at the camera and then he smiled. And, and it was like this, this, this moment where he, he knew what I was doing and he appreciated it and he appreciated the dignity of the situation. Um, and it was like this moment of, of solidarity, which is really hard to achieve um, from people with two very lived, uh, different lived experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have to be honest, like all those people you saw in the, the film are like family to me. They're very good friends of mine. Um, and if they weren't in the beginning, they are now. And um, Tiza, um, every location we went to, she's the Indonesian woman who's super articulate. Um, uh, every location we went to, we did car karaoke. So I, I want to express like how much joy still exists um, in these places where, you know, we look at with like such horror, but everywhere you have culture and you have, you know, um, you, you still have joy, you have smiling children. These are not miserable people, you know, and we don't want to feel like um, sorry for them because um, that's patronizing and awful. And it's something I learned along the way that like, yeah, some of this stuff is really hard to look at, but these are people just like you and me who have bad days and good days and are happy and sad. 
Um, and that was that universal humanism, I think, um, was pretty cool. And to also know that, like, no matter where you go in the world, everybody knows, like, pop songs from you know everywhere like everybody knows beyonce everybody knows taylor like and so it was like it was funny awesome awesome melissa same to you yeah yeah that's a that's a really great question mark and it has happened so many times that Um, I just automatically anticipate it right from the get-go. And so we start, you know, we try to start by doing a couple of things, anticipating those moments. A, because people are anxious when, I mean, I'm anxious when I have a camera in front of my face. Um, But B, because a lot of times in the kinds of stories that we're capturing, you know, there's a lot of trauma that has happened and a lot of pain. And so people are reserved, understandably. And so we'll do a couple of things and then I'll share the, the most recent time that it happened. One is um, we don't talk about the subject matter before we're rolling at all. Um, we just don't go there. And so uh, I try, we try very hard to talk about other things. Um, if they start to delve into it, I try to kind of, you know, reroute them to, to live somewhere else first until we get, until it's rolling. Um, and I always remind them that, um, that we have complete control over, that they have complete control over what's being recorded. And so if at any moment they feel, um, like they didn't say the right thing to stop us and we can start over or we can just take a break. So I just try to be, you know, make it really as comfortable as you can. Um, so I, we just released Invisible Hand. Um, we had the virtual premiere uh, two weeks ago. And of course, because this is how it always goes, at least for us, I don't know about you guys, but we were shooting the last, like the la- last minute interview, like six days before the premiere. It's like, seriously, I planned so hard for this not to happen this time and it still did. Anyway, so that was happening. Um, we were recording our friend Dega Minodas, um, uh, who is Seneca, Wolf Clan, and he was, I'd ask him a a couple questions about, um, so Invisible Hand is about the rights of nature movement and and the fundamental core problems of our society that end up leading to all of these other problems we have. Everything from genocide to racism to ecocide to climate change, um, water pollution. And so we're talking about how to change uh, our society in a fundamental way and I could tell, you know, he, he'd answered the question and he was, he was pausing and I never, I always let that silence sit. I'll let it sit for forever. Um, but then it felt like we were kind of done. We'd worked through the science silence and we, we got done. And so I sh- we shut the camera off, but I always keep the audio rolling. Um, and I did. And as soon as the camera was off, he remembered, you could see it. It was like a light bulb went off in his head. And he said, the story that the peace, the lesson that the peacemaker gave us, gave our people is this. And then he just spit it out in 20 seconds and it was perfect. And it ended up being the perfect ending for the film. We only got the audio, but that's totally fine. You know, Uh, we got a lot of, we had B-roll of him in the canoe, you know, on the river. So anyway, that just, that just happened. Always leave the audio rolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a fine line I found of you know trust with your with your interviewee and allowing them to have access to that genius moment within themselves without betraying their trust of filming them in a moment when they didn't expect to be filmed. So it, it's a delicate moment that I find is a. It's like the tw- you know the. The, the twilight, the golden light period, but topically in a, in a film. Um, thank you both for those reflections. Um, 
And as we talked about a little bit beforehand, you know, we have like just a handful of minutes before we want to break it into uh, public questioning, but we've got like, you know, pages and pages of questions to, uh, to talk about. So I really want to kind of, I want to geek out about film stuff with you. I want to geek out about plastic issues with you. I want to just, I want to go down all the rabbit holes. Um, so I'm going to, you know, just try to, to divvy it out so that we, we leverage some rabbit holes from questions from the audience. But anyway, I'll stop talking about that and let's just get straight into more. Um, it, I was really moved by your, your paying close attention to the, how pollution was tantamount to genocide on people of color. You said those words in this interview, but you talk about that as a, you know, an essential part of your film. Um, and I've, I've, um, I think there's so much more. I'm so glad you're making a whole other film about that. I'm, I'm also curious to know, um, you know, there were a lot of uh, moments where in the film, I saw some, some medium old white guy talking about how clean their amazingly polluted thing was that they were making gazillions of dollars off of. And it was just sort of like almost, you know, it's sort of like, oh yeah, there's another rich white guy saying how clean their polluting thing is. Um, did you have, can you talk about racism in industry, not just as pollution, but in the structures of hiring and in the structures of, of you know, yeah, like upstream and who gets the jobs and, um, and, and yeah, just, I guess, go, go beyond that pollution side, if you could, Stiv, and tell me about if you found anything out about and, and can speak to the, the racism in, in other parts of this industry. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's inherent in, in, you know, I mean, it depends on how far back you want to go, but there has been a coordinated history from white men in power since the founding of our country to find a politically acceptable form of slavery to continue. And so, you know, I, I think like, you know, it, it's it's not the same words. It's more dog whistles, and it's more. Um, uh, it, it 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 feels like it it's more sinister and more uh, um, devious. Uh, but it, but you just need to look at where these places are, and and not not only on the the upstream end, on the the extraction and refining end, but also on the downstream on the like where this waste is going. Um, and, you know, in, in Indonesia, where, where, where waste is dumped, where, you know, the, the seas that my friend Priggy is walking through in the film, um, you know, there's no old people there. And industry, you know, beyond the pollution, they structurally know that the communities there cannot fight back against this waste coming. And, and that's by design. And this is certainly true of you know, a lot of places on the Gulf Coast and um, the Ohio River Valley. It is the systemic racism that our country is founded on has an effect where you don't have the same opportunity, you don't have the same um, resources to fight back. And, and every now and again, you get like a shining example of people who against all odds were able to organize and stop something like I'm really inspired by Rise St. James right now in, in St. James Parish in Louisiana and Sharon Levine. Uh, Sharon Levine is a Christian uh, grandmother who's retired and woke up one day and realized, you know, she was touched by the Holy Spirit as it were and um, recognized that She's just not going to let people die in her neighborhood based on, you know, this foreign company, Formosa, coming in and building this, this plant. And uh, she and her team have been able to achieve stuff. But, you know, they didn't get, you know, the media wasn't there. I mean, like, Amy Goodman was there. But, like, let's be clear, in social media circles, we live in bubbles. And, like, you might get a 1,000 likes on your post of – you know, Rise St. James, but, but nobody in power is seeing that. That's, that's designed. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't getting to a broader audience. And then 
other folks stepped in and, and helped to amplify that message more. So I'm not meaning to skirt your question, but it's like none of these places would exist. And if the, in the first place, you could never build any of these places if you hadn't for decades systemically worked against community resiliency by design. You, you, you like, you know, I live in San Francisco. Across the bay is the richest zip code in the entire United States, uh, um, in Tiburon, Marin County. Y there's no, none of this stuff is built. Like you can't even like, you can't even have a billboard, you know, because it's like, it's, you know, it's aesthetic pollution. And so, um, and you have people with time, money and resources to, and, and frankly, the power to elect or unelect people if they don't do their bidding. And, and if you are a multinational corporation who wants to build a very polluting industry, you need to do it in places where people, you know, um, have less opportunity to fight back. Um, and less resources. I'm not, and, and I don't want to say they don't have the talent, the agency, or the 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 um, intellect, you know, because that's not the case at all. You know, there's smart people everywhere in this country. Um, but if you if you don't have the opportunity, you don't have the shot, and you don't have the tax base, you, you have a hard time, you know, going against powers. I mean, let's face it, like. Texas is owned by industry, you know? If you're like Tejas there working in Houston, you know, you can't get a grant because they own the university. You can't even speak at the university. They own the hospital. They like, it's designed from start to finish to keep a certain part of the population down so that they can run rampant and do whatever they want. And it's the same on the other side when, where the waste goes. Yeah, yeah. I think that, um, you know, I was actually thinking about Melissa's film, Invisible Hand, as you were talking about those things that keep people down. And I wondered, Melissa, you want to reflect a little bit on, you know, tease that out a little bit of how people are kept down by an invisible hand. How does that work? And what have you learned in your filmmaking about that? Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. Yes, Steve, it's, Steve's absolutely right. It, this is a system by design. And so who are the designers, right? The designers uh, were property owning slaveholders, and now they are, are capitalists. Where in a corporatocracy, where um, ev where the corporate multinational corporations and everything they want to do is above the law. I mean, look at what happened. Look at the you know what's happening with Dapple. A federal judge ordered energy transfer to shut that pipe down and the corporation replied you can't stop the flow of crude oil so they literally believe and to this and every day um, are above are operating above the law and so i too came to filmmaking through journalism and i came to it to journalism through water as well, Stiv, um, through rivers, and um, then the contamination of water from fracking and the cover up of water contamination from fracking in Pennsylvania. Um, and it became really clear through that process, that's how I, that was my um, coming up into and maturing into the knowledge that this is a far deeper and more systemic problem than water contamination. And, and, I've, and when I was watching your film, um, Stiv, I was like, you know, this is the story of plastic, but it's also the story of capitalism. It's also um, the problem is not just pl the plastics. The problem is not just fracking, which is where plastics come from. The problem is the economic system that we have that makes it perfectly, that makes the, the crime of genocide, ecocide, um, and the, everything in between, okay. It's a system that literally makes that legal. And, um, 
anyway, it's there it in all of the work being done around to fight plastics, plastic pollution and to fight fracking. Um, there are so many good fights happening. Um, my worry every day um, is that all of these good fights. My question is, are the good fights the fights that are going to win? Because until we address the systemic problem, what's the next, what's the next problem? Um, you know, what's the next problem after plastics? Um, is it, I mean, it could be a number of things. And so in, in the film, Invisible Hand, that's what we're kind of getting at. We're getting at um, the, the rights of nature movement and the community rights movement as a way to flip the hierarchy of power. Um, Stiv, you said that we need to put more stakeholders in positions of leadership. We have to give we have to get more stakeholders in positions of power. And I, and I want to suggest that though nature doesn't vote, nature can certainly have power and representation in the law and in the concrete actions that we directly, that you and I and all of us directly engage in every single day. And so um, anyway, Stiv, yeah, for me, this film um, is, is really gets, again, gets down to that systemic problem. Um, and I'm wondering if for you, did you, um, did you examine economics and like, you know, uh, criminal capitalism before you came to plastics? Or was that something that kind of came um, into your, uh, your focal point with plastic, if that makes sense? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say yes, but not quite formally. And part of it was like, and I, I really hope people don't laugh out loud, but I grew up skateboarding and the sort of anti-hero, anti-establishment, anti-corporate rock um, don't, it, it's not, it's the many, not the one, um, the ethics. And, and when I, you know, I'm old enough that like, skateboarding when I started was was counterculture and what I appreciated about it so much was it was like a brother and sisterhood of people from different socioeconomic backgrounds and it didn't it didn't matter all that mattered is if you tried and you supported the whole and that the sort of rising tide would risk would 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 lift all boats and that was sort of the idea of this anti-hero. Like we put so much stock in the individual in Western societies where the eco-hero or the eco-goddess or the eco-badass. Um, and, you know, that has an effect of sort of really not raising the entire populace up to demonstrate that the system is rigged. And the system is rigged in a very small percentage of people's favor. And once you have money, you know, like, unless you're like, you know, Nicolas Cage, you, you can hold on to it, you know, like you can, or Johnny Depp, as long as you just like, if you structurally, you can hold on to power with money. And, and that like, that I knew from the get-go, from my sort of like indoctrination to Thrasher magazine, which was super subversive, activism, anti-capitalism um, theory. I mean, skateboarding's become commercialized, which is also another product of capitalism. But I was into punk music. Um, I was into early like rap and hip hop. And, you know, those messages are are in it throughout and that was sort of my that was my my unformal education um but it had just an effect you know as my formal education so i, I think i'm getting at your question not as succinctly as i could have but yeah i had i'd always been like f to the man from the second i could speak Thanks, Dave. I was a hard child to raise, frankly. My, my parents <laughs> went through the ringer. <laughs> oh, thank you. That, yeah, super interesting uh, background and great line of questioning there, Melissa. Thank you for that. Um, 
the there's been some discussion there's great discussion in the chat if you're not looking at the chat for side conversations to 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 sort of uh, address your multi-screen addiction feelings um, you can definitely get your game on there um, and i've been paying attention and jotting down some of the questions that you've been writing uh, that that you've that you've got that, that i'll get to that very soon um, I wanted to just bring up another topic here that we've sort of touched on a little bit, but I'll, I'm going to tie it a little bit um, back to with my yurt film, Your Environmental Road Trip. You know, we traveled around. We tried to keep our garbage to a minimum. We, we reduced our garbage on the trip to one one hundredth of a shoot of an average American's garbage um, for the whole year. And we thought that was quite an accomplishment at the time. And and as I was reflecting on some of the, you know, the challenges that we're looking at here with the with the framing of, of whether this is a consumer issue or a supplier issue or a capitalism issue. I'm kind of interested in seeing how you can completely demolish our attempt to do good by the environment by cutting our individualized garbage. Tell me like how, how can citizens who are trying to reduce their waste think about their own efforts in the context of a broader system that really needs their support but that they can't be solved by just one person just shutting down their plastic consumption at the you know at the end use stage. It's a great question. So and I'm sure Melissa has thoughts on this as well. Um, Shame, you know, what, shamelessly like trash the the gig that we did with the you know cutting our garbage if you need to. Yeah. Well, look, I I think you know like if I'm if I'm you know, it, depending on the crowd I'm into, I'll, I'll say it takes a village and all, all, all actions matter. And, you know, if I'm in a more intimate setting, I'll say not all actions matter, sorry. And, you know, the thing about it is like, you know, it's really interesting, this, our film's super multicultural. So, you know, part of our film crew were vegetarians and vegans and, you know, uh, this kind of stuff, and it was because of climate issues. And, you know, when you get to certain countries, like, they talk about those kind of things as a, an incredible privilege. To be a vegan is an incredible privilege. And um, it's because, you know, these are cultures that you eat what is put in front of you, and you finish it, and you don't waste any food. When you cut a fish, you don't just take the fillet. You eat the eyes, you eat the head, you make stock out of the carcass. You know, every every piece is appreciated, and and I think, you know, that whole that totality is is what you know we really need to look at. You know, the American has gotten pretty lazy in our duty, our civic duties um, and democracy. And social media is affecting this a lot. I mean, there's, there's goods to social media. But, you know, this was organized through social media. However, the average American spends 48 minutes a day on Facebook. And, and if you're somebody upset with the state of the world, you write and you, you write your rant about what's happening in the world and your friends like it, but you are literally doing nothing to move the needle because nobody in power is reading that. Nobody who even disagrees with you is reading that because that's the way social media algorithms work. So we need to transfer that space and that energy back into civic engagement. And so, yeah, like, yes, do the personal efficiencies, take a reusable bag, take a reusable cup, you know, but only about 4% of what's coming out of a fracking well is going to Starbucks cups and plastic bags and straws and that kind of thing. So industry will fight tooth and nail um, in legislatures to not have product bans, but it's a bait and switch because they don't care they don't care if it's a straw or a car bumper or a chemical to dissolve plastic or a chemical for fur like it just they just want it to be fossil fuel derived and so you can't ever zero in on one thing you have to look at the only system and the only way you get systemic policy is through collective action and i think you know in this era i am i am hoping that you know i'm so inspired by you know, the racial justice protests and BLM right now. 
and 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 not backing down at all and saying no this country is going to have this reckoning now and we are not letting go this time we are not going to let another kid die you know this has got to stop and so that to me is really heartening and really inspiring i see the protests in hong kong you know where like 10 million people were coming out every single day and if you look at theory of change what we need to actually change the society is 3.5 percent of the people out every day 10 million people and no one can hide from that mcconnell can't hide trump can't hide like nobody can hide from that but if we just spend time on facebook pissed off we lose and you know and we're also insulated in our own bubble and it's time to step to the street nonviolently and peacefully it's time to cede space and let the voices that have been oppressed take center stage and to facilitate that um but yeah you know take a reusable cup in your bag but don't think you're changing the world by doing that super thank you steve um melissa you unmuted yourself but i have a question i was going to move to uh audience questions but melissa do you have an a follow-on comment there i agree with I just wanted to agree with everything you said, Steve, and also um, the reason that we are failing the fracking fight in Pennsylvania, and what, and I, we are absolutely failing um, in fighting fracking, um, not just in Pennsylvania, but in Appalachia, because we aren't in the streets, um, and we aren't shutting shit down with our bodies. We are not acting directly in Appalachia. We are asking for permission to not be polluted and for we are asking legislators to please stop no we will make it stop and that's the only way it's going to happen thank you melissa you mic dropped it i saw that <laughs> at the end of your comment mic drop or mic mute mic mute okay so i'd like to move into some of the audience questions so if you have audience questions i've got a bunch here I probably have enough to wrap us through the end of the event but um if you have a burning question you'd like to ask please drop it in the chat and um i will weigh it against the other ones that i already have um i have a great question that i'm really curious about from patricia demarco she asks this i'm gonna i'm gonna ask the full question then i'm gonna try to narrow it a little bit so we can get to multiple questions here um, she says, how can we move our materials management process from a linear trajectory, raw materials to trash, to a circular trajectory, material reuse and recapture by design for zero waste? How can we generate the public demand for a different set of legal and regulatory infrastructure to drive this absolutely critical transformation? I think we got into the second part of that question just a little bit, but I'm really curious about the first part of that question, because I felt like, Steve, in your film, you talked a lot about the tech, like a lot about the pollution, and you talked a lot about some of the the, you know, the, the challenges and the structural elements, but I was really, I was really curious to see if you would talk at all about hemp or talk about other types of substrates that we could use in more detail about like, what does it actually look like to swap out the plastic in this thing for some other thing that is compatible with nature that, that allows us to have at least some fraction of the things that we need to operate every day just as a human being. Um, what does that look like? How do we get there? How do we think about it? What are the resources that we can tap to get, help us get there? First, let's start with how we think about it. Like one of the problems with change in this space is immediately when you get into a policy circle, the first question is, well, what's the substitute? You know, if you are gonna remove this from commerce, what comes in and takes the place and is sustainable and doesn't hurt anybody? And I'm like, the answer is, that's the wrong question. It's how do you change the product delivery system itself to design out waste as an externalization and a byproduct of that transaction. Because the truth is like, we want potato chips. We don't want potato chips bags. We want coffee. We don't want coffee cups. So how do we get this to people in a way that is um, sustainable instead of trying to look for a miracle substitution or a miracle way of dealing at the end of life. And so that's even harder because people just don't think that way. They, they think that like status quo, you can tweak a little bit here or there or whatever. Um, it, but it's all about re-envisioning the system. And so I would say like the one thing, the most valuable, um, the, the most valuable piece of 
the sort of product ban um, work in the plastic space is that it creates a new market for different kinds of systems. And so like, you know, on the right, they'll argue it's like it's anti jobs. And I'm like, well, even in capitalism, the market abhors a vacuum. So like, as soon as you ban one thing, there's going to be a hundred entrepreneurs stepping up to the plate. So yeah, let's quit saying, how are we going to substitute that? If we actually believe in free markets, um, which I don't really, Freedom, but if, then. Yeah. if we do, the market would, would figure that out um, itself. And so I think, yeah, that's the first system is like looking at reuse and refill systems. And, you know, the other the other piece of this, like we profile the zero waste system in the Philippines. This, this, you know, to do the entire country of the Philippines, so not a single piece of plastic escaped into the environment or had to be burned, would cost 80 to 100 million dollars, which is nothing for a country as populous as 120 million. That's no money. The problem is it's a threat to wealth and power consolidation because what happens when you introduce these systems is the community becomes more resilient. They, it creates green jobs. Um, it property values go up. So people's personal wealth goes up. Um, and that sort of community resiliency is a direct threat to the status quo power. And this is exactly when we translate that to the United States, if all of a sudden people in St. James Parish have a medium income of $120,000 a year, Formosa is never going to be able to build there. So um, I think like we have to look at how do we transform the system and really build community resiliency um, and transform the system itself on how we deliver products. And you know, the fact of the matter is like, who wants to live in a world that's all like Applebee's, Walmart, like chili, like, you know, everything that makes like our lived experience good is like going to Chinatown in a city and eating some dumplings that you could never like find. Um, or, you know, like everybody eats Mexican food and then is anti-immigrant all of a sudden. I'm like, what? Like you realize like one of the staples of your diet comes from a culture that you are actively oppressing. And, and so I guess, you know, the way I look at it is what makes life good is diversity of culture and community resiliency. That's fun to walk around in. Um, that's fun to get a drink in. That's fun to have dinner in. And, and so I think that's what we need to focus on. What is the actual essential good stuff of life? And the truth is single use ketchup packets never make that list. Yeah, yeah. Um, there have been some questions about um, micro nanoplastics um, and you touched on that a little bit, but I think it's, um, I'd love to have you touch on that a little bit more, particularly with the, with the consideration of leachate of endocrine disruptors from microplastics and other plastics accumulated throughout the ocean, throughout the landfills and things like that. And also the, I think the multi the, or the multi-generational nature of the influences of that type of pollution um, that could also be built into a racial justice issue as well. Not just of this generation, but of multiple generations affected by some of these endocrine disruptors coming out of plastics. Can you speak to the microplastics and the endocrine disruption multi-generational thing, you know, just in like two minutes? <laughs> yeah, as quickly as I can. So, yeah. you know, the issue with plastic is sunlight and mechanical action makes it break into small pieces. Um, if you think of plastic chemically like a pearl nexid, necklace, the hydrocarbon molecule is very resilient. The polymer chain that connects it, which is the string, is very weak. So it will, it will degrade into very, very small pieces. Now, any plastic that is made to give it the performance attributes that it has needs an additive. So the endocrine disrupting ones that we know of um, most prolifically are bifacinol A and phthalates. Bifacinol A will make something rigid. Um, phthalates will make it malleable. And so um, uh, 
so that those leach into the environment when the plastic breaks apart or they off gas, both in water and in land and in soil or whatever. And so because plastic is so resilient from a, a monomer, from a hydrocarbon molecule, it's everywhere in the world. It's airborne, it's in food systems, it's in our bodies. And there's no health studies, um, either chronic or acute uh, health studies on, on these plastic additives because they're pri proprietary. Now, people have figured out BPA, but what did industry do? They added one more um, element to it, a sulfur molecule, and made BPS, which is actually worse from an endocrine disrupting standpoint, but hadn't been studied. So like they would market BPA free, but what they, the, the substitute was actually more dangerous. So, um, and this is like, you know, this is a threat um, everywhere in the world. It rains plastic, you breathe plastic every time you do laundry. Um, and yeah, and now at the nanoscale, it has the ability to permeate the, the, the blood vessel. So it can, it can actually get into your brain because it's so small. Um, which like, just scares the hell out of um, people when I say this. But it's also, it's not just endocrine disrupting, it's uh, cancer causing as well. And so um, everything associated with this material causes harm somewhere, whether even just flaring off the stuff you don't want, you know, that causes an incredible amount of harm at extraction. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I think and yet that's that, my clean, two minutes are up. Let's say it's clean and inert, you know, and yet, Surprise. Um, Melissa, did you have uh, a question from burning off of your list of amazing questions you want to share? Yeah, I have, a, I have a bit of a film geek question, which is, uh, Stiv, I was blown away by the advertising, the ads for plastics um, from like back in the 50s and 60s that you used, that you featured in the film. Um, I'm like, they were just so, it's just so obvious. This is, this was, a, this was a, this is a market capital economic campaign uh, through and through. My question is, where did you find your best stuff? Where did you find those things? So some of this stuff, I've been in this game long enough to know about, you know, some of these industry front NGOs, like, in any issue area, whether it's climate, whether it's toxics, whether it's plastics, industry will prop up um, both now and historically a nonprofit. Like if you are in the flame retardants business, you will create a nonprofit called um, People for Children Safety from Fire. You know, like you will, and, and so this is where Keep America Beautiful came from. And so we knew this and we knew the connections from oil and gas to getting people on the right elected. So we knew these PR campaigns. And my editors, Tony um, Hale and Brian Wilson, went down rabbit holes like to find this stuff and cut the exact amount we could use, you know, from a fair use standpoint um, without getting sued. Um, I mean, we were astonished that Discovery Network picked this up um, as a distributor because we were like, this is, this is too much for Discovery Network. Um, but they did. But yeah, it was a massive um, amount of research because we decided from the get-go that we did not want to interview industry because we knew what they were going to say. We knew, we, we'd heard it at every you know, policy hearing at like, we knew what their standard stock lines were. And we just didn't want to give them camera space to say that stuff. So we knew if we like, they put their conference like recordings up on YouTube. And so, and they never knew that they were speaking. Like, that's what I love about these guys is there's so much wealth and power, but they have no idea that anybody's ever going to listen to the things they're saying in a closed room in a conference of friendlies. And we wanted to throw that back in their face. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Um, it prompts my other question of, uh, that I was thinking of, uh, Steve, you've 
I've looked a lot for uh, stock footage of plastic, just amazing, awful, nasty plastic footage. And I'm wondering if you have now a treasure trove of stock footage that you could make available in the public domain so that all filmmakers around the world can just like use public domain stock footage without credits, give you a cup of coffee, you know, with a like, tip or something and just unleash that on the world's video makers. Just a thought. Yeah, we certainly are, we're certainly interested in that. And it's like, um, technically the way it's structured, all the stuff that wasn't in the movie, um, Dea, my director's production company owns, which is not to say like she would give it readily to anybody who asks. Um, I think we need an interface to to make sure there's a there's a filter because you could take some of this footage and blame Indonesian people with it. You could mm -hmm. so we don't want it to be used um, against the very folks who provided it. But there's also another layer like like a lot of stuff we filmed. You just no white people ever filmed before, especially in um, in Southeast Asia. Um, and so there's some political danger for um, some of the folks that helped us get into those spaces. So we need a bit of a filter and a bit of security on that to ensure, you know, people aren't harmed by that. But that said, the spirit of this film from the very beginning was free and open access to anybody who wants to use it. And at storyofplastic.org, you can do a screening like this. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, if, if you want to rent it, it's two bucks. Um, yeah, you know, super. Yeah, that's great. Um, we've got four more minutes left. Um, and there's a question that came from the audience. Um, Ed Wren asked a question that I think might close us out. I think it's a good sort of looking into the future um, question. He asks, how can we get threats to human health from plastic and other pollution to be a higher political priority issue? And related, how can political candidates communicate more effectively about this? Steve and Melissa both maybe? I don't know, Steve, can you do it in, in two and a half minutes? I'm gonna let Melissa take this one first because I've talked a lot. Okay, yeah. And I'm curious good. what she has to say. Mm. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Um, politics. Okay. I, I'm I, personally, I'm just kind of, I mean, I'm going to vote, um, but I'm kind of done with politics. I, and the reason is, is, is because we are in a very urgent situation and you know, we're losing 150 to 200 species every single day. The web of life is literally falling apart. Um, pollution is part of the problem, um, but the problem is our, is our system and politics is our system. And so for me, because, and especially due to our incredibly, our, our shrinking window of time that we have, I, I don't look to politics. I look to the people around me. And what I want to see is people in the streets. What I want to see is people passing their own democratically enacted local laws saying, we decide what happens in this community. And if you're a corporation that, you, that plans on polluting or poisoning, like, see ya, get the F out of here. Um, what I wanna see is more direct forms of action and less indirect forms of action. What I mean by that is politics is indirect. That is us going to somebody else, taking the time to convince them to do what we think, what needs to be done to protect us. That's indirect. And that takes a lot of time. You have to convince a lot of people and then if you find a senator or a governor who you do get into a position, a leadership position, then they have to go and they have to convince a whole other group of people in order to, and it's incredibly time intensive process and we don't have that time. And so for me, again, to, to echo what, what Stiv said a little bit ago, I think it's the wrong question. I think, we need to be looking to ourselves and to our neighbors and saying, 
what must be done, and then linking arms and doing it. So. The I'm only done. thing I'll add, because I agree with you, and I think the Black Lives Matter movement has made race, racial justice front and center in the presidential election in a way that would get short shrift in any other debate. Um, and, and, you know, Biden on the, the left, you know, has had to educate himself to speak, you know, um, correctly towards the theory of change about it. Um, and Trump is doubling down on white supremacy through dog whistles. But that many people in the streets have forced it to become a political issue. So let's get people into the streets and let's link arms like Melissa says. Steve, that was awesome. I'll just want to add one thing and then I'll turn it over to Diane for closing. Um, my comment on this topic as well is, is that I, my instinct is, is that I think there'll be a massive reallocation of wealth as people wake up and realize that they don't want to wait around for wealthy people to find a way to profit from saving our planet while it's actually burning. All the while they're holding on to all the wealth necessary to solve all the problems. So they're just holding a dam full of money that need, we need to, to solve all the problems while they're watching a burn and trying to make a profit. And I don't think that's gonna stand. And I think that um, Steve's comment about how you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement and all of these reckonings we're having that we're going to have this reckoning right now. I think the more we glom together as a, as a unified movement across all these different um, um, essential causes, the more success we'll have in having a greater, more powerful, potent reckoning um, for the ages. So those are my two cents. Um, and with that, uh, Diane, I'd love to turn it over to you for closing out. And Melissa and Stiv, thank you so much for your insights, your commentary, and your wisdom that we've touched on just the tip of the iceberg here today. I wish we could have like a five-hour conversation with each of you or all of you together, but um, just not this week. Thanks. <laughs> well, I did. I actually thank you, Mark, and thank you, Mark, and, and Steve, and Melissa. You're right. I actually did try to reach out to our tech guys saying, can we have a little bit more time? But I understand that we, we only asked for you to be here till 8.30. But um, there's so much to say and so much to said and so much to act on. But thank you for this conversation. Um, I, I was interested. This is, this is a really personal event for me, not just because I was part of the team that put it on, but it bring back, brings back memories of the very first um, environmental event I put on back in Batavia, Illinois. Shout out to Batavia, where we started a green ad at the movies and the um, topic was plastics. And that was over a decade ago. And I was interested in reading in the chat that someone said that they had watched it more than one time, this film, and was moved to tears. Um, I hope Steve doesn't mind me sharing this story. Um, I also was really touched by this film. There's a lot of plastic films out, out there, but this one really touched me in a, in a new way. And that's important in a new way. And um, thank you, Stiv. The reason I first saw this film is, um, truth be known, uh, I was at an event and I met Stiv at the bar and he welcomed me into a screening and it was such a joy to see this film. And at the end of the film, we all stood up and applauded and turned around. Stiv, are you gonna kill me for telling you this, telling this story? And turned around and there was Stiv with his hand his head in his hands, sobbing. So if you cry watching this movie, you are not alone, you are in good company. Stiv, your journey, your humility, your humility in putting this together, just thank you. And thank you for all the filmmakers and all the activists that are working so hard. We need to work harder, I know, but thank you. Um, I, as a special treat, um, the, the uh, story of stuff people, story of plastics people are letting us still view this film until the end of this month. So if you, like I, after watching this conversation, are kind of interested in going back and saying, I'd like to see that again, you can just go back to the same links we sent out. Remember, this is just the beginning. I hope to see you tomorrow at seven o'clock, seven to 10. Saturday, 10 to 2, and on Sunday. So join us. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Mark, Melissa, Steve.
Thank you. Thanks, all. Mark, Melissa. Thanks, Diane. Good night. Be well. And to all of you for watching the film. Thank you so much, everybody. And we'll see you in the rest of the summit. Uh, if you go to the A to Z Impacts of Plastic Summit uh, website where you see all the events, you can leave comments, you can share directly into the activity feed, and you can RSVP to other events that are coming up over the weekend to kind of build out your schedule. And also keep in mind that um, our, I'm here, the rest of our team is here to help out with any technical problems. We want this to be super accessible for all of us. And um, please invite your friends. There's an invite button right there within the network that you can use to send emails to your friends and they can join. And you can also just tell people impacts to plastic.com. So yeah, this is fantastic. And um, thank you, Diane, for, for hosting and everybody else, uh, Mark and Melissa and Stiv and, uh, and BJ for uh, such a great event. And do remember, this has been recorded, so you can share it. You can watch it again. Please do. Thanks. Definitely. All right. Bye, everybody.